Good morning, and thank you to all the educators and students joining us today for the Universal Suffrage for Women of Color in Iowa presentation with our speaker, Eric Morse. Women of color were often left out of the broader conversation around women's suffrage rights. Before and after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, non-white women were often discriminated against and blocked from voting by various discriminatory measures. Today, we will learn the stories of African-American women from Iowa who tirelessly fought for universal suffrage for all women. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this presentation on mute with cameras off. The presentation is being recorded and a link will be placed on the History Alive Votes for Women webpage next week. I have disabled the chat function, but I encourage you to ask your questions using the Q&A feature. My colleague Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm very happy to introduce our speaker. Eric Morse is the founder of the Central Iowa Community Museum, a new museum that seeks to work with diverse communities to enhance understanding of the world, each other, and the issues we must face together. He created the traveling exhibit called Toward a Universal Suffrage, African-American Women in Iowa and the Vote for All. You can find out more and get involved at centraliowamuseum.com. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Eric to begin the presentation. Thank you, uh, Jennifer, and thank you for inviting me to speak today and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to tell you about African-American women in Iowa who are suffragists. A suffragist is someone who advocates for the right to vote, either for themselves or for others. 2020 is the 100th anniversary of women winning the right to vote. Women won this right by adding an amendment to our constitution, the 19th amendment. That amendment was added to the constitution in 1920. As Jennifer said, my talk this morning is based on a museum exhibition I created on this subject. And as she said, that exhibition is called Toward a Universal Suffrage, African-American Women in Iowa and the Vote for All. Before I begin, I want to make note of some of the language I'll be using today. We must be respectful of others by using acceptable words to identify someone's race, culture, or identity what is considered acceptable has changed over time. 100 years ago, colored was an acceptable word. Later, Negro was preferred. Today, the preferred words are African American or Black American. You will hear all of these words used in my presentation. The reason for that is because in the past, the acceptable words at the time were used in the titles of organizations, such as some of the women's clubs I'll be talking about. This is the story of a colored woman living in a white world. It cannot possibly be like a story written by a white woman. A white woman has only one handicap to overcome, that of sex. I have two, both sex and race. These words were said by Mary Church Terrell. Mrs. Terrell was a nationally known African-American women's rights and suffrage leader. Many of the women profiled in this presentation either knew her or were influenced by her work on a personal and national level. In this quote, Mrs. Terrell states why it is important to do this exhibition. The story that is widely known about women's suffrage is a white story. The contributions of African-American suffragists are less known. We specifically created this exhibition to create, to make sure the contributions of Iowa's African-American women suffragists would not be forgotten this year. In the women's suffrage movement in this country, all women had to overcome bias based on their gender. African-American women faced an additional hurdle, that of their race. Next, I'm going to share information about some of the African-American women in Iowa who were suffragists. Gertrude Durden Rush was born in Texas. She was the daughter of a Baptist minister. Her family later moved to the Midwest. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, Mrs. Rush was a teacher and she eventually moved to Des Moines. 
Mrs. Rush furthered her education at Des Moines College, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts in 1914, and then went on to study law. She passed the Iowa bar in 1918, becoming the first African-American woman in the state of Iowa to do so. Later, in 1924, she was denied admittance to the American Bar Association. In response to the American Bar Association's practice of denying admission to African-Americans, Mrs. Rush and sev several other African-American men founded what was then known as the Negro Bar Association. It is now called the National Bar Association and is still working. The NBA is a network of predominantly African-American attorneys and judges. Mrs. Rush remained the only African-American woman to practice law in the state of Iowa until the 1950s. Throughout her life, Mrs. Rush was an activist and was involved in many organizations dedicated to African-American and women's rights. She was the president of the Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs from 1911 to 1915. She was also an active member of the NAACP and the Colored Women's Suffrage Club. She believed that African-American women's right to vote was an opportunity for equality. She saw the vote as a way to end racial discrimination and injustice. Sue M. Wilson Brown was born in Virginia in 1877. Her parents, Jacob and Maria, came to Iowa to mine coal. Sometime after graduating from Oskaloosa High School, she met and married her husband, S. Joe Brown, in 1902, and they later moved to Des Moines. Throughout her life, Mrs. Brown was known as an organizer and a doer. She mobilized people at the local, state, and national levels to improve the political, economic, and social status of African Americans. From 1907 to 1909, she founded and published The Iowa Colored Woman, a monthly magazine reporting news about the Iowa State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. She also was business manager for the National Association of Colored Women. She also took a leading part in preserving Frederick Douglass's house in Washington, D.C. Frederick Douglass escaped slavery in Maryland and became one of our nation's leaders in the movement to abolish slavery. Mrs. Brown established and participated in many women's clubs to advocate for change. She founded the Des Moines Mary Church Terrell Club and the Des Moines League of Colored Women Voters, among many others. As president of the Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs from 1915 to 1917, Mrs. Brown worked with the Polk County Suffrage Association to speak at meetings, march in parades, and distribute suffrage literature. Mrs. Brown and her husband established the Des Moines chapter of the NAACP, and she became the first female president of this chapter in 1925. In downtown Des Moines, we have this beautiful pedestrian bridge that crosses the Des Moines River. This is the Women, Women of Achievement Bridge. Each year, an organization called Women Lead Change seeks nominations for important women whose name should be added to plaques on this bridge. Since the work of this exhibition is to make sure that these important women are remembered, we nominated Mrs. Brown as a 2020 Woman of Achievement. And I'm very happy to tell you that our nomination was accepted. A plaque with her name will be added to the bridge. And I also wanna note that Gertrude Rush, her name is already on the bridge. Helena Jane Downey, also known as Helen, was born around 1875 in Ottumwa, Iowa. She was married to Russell Downey, also an Ottumwa resident. She was the first honorary president of the Iowa branch of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, later known as the Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. This Iowa club was founded under her leadership in 1902. She and many other leading members of the Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs assisted other clubs in their development and worked hard towards the advancement 
of African American women, especially young students. She worked diligently within this organization to secure housing for African American women who were students at the University of Iowa. Another organization that Helen was a very active member of was the Ida B. Wells Club. This organization was also founded in 1902. In addition to the club she founded and was a member of, she also spoke at events that the organizations would sponsor. One of her speeches, Our Girls, may have been her own take on white suffragist Elizabeth Cady Stanton's speech of the same name. Vivian B. Smith spent most of her life in and around Waterloo. She is recognized as one of the women who were public advocates for women's suffrage during the early 1900s. Ms. Smith believed a woman's right to vote would be beneficial to women and men of color as well. Ms. Smith served as a member of the Waterloo Suffragette Council. She also served as the suffrage chairman for the Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs and was an editor for the organization. In addition to her direct work with the suffrage movement, Vivian Smith was also a talented violinist and singer. She would often perform a violin selection at Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs meetings. She was also a teacher. One of the reasons we wanted to put together this exhibition is to highlight the diversity and difference that was part of the women's suffrage movement. In this section of the presentation, I'm going to explain what the women's suffrage movement was like for African-American women, especially here in Iowa. The roots of women's suffrage in the United States are found in the movement to abolish slavery. One of the reasons slavery was abolished and women gained the right to vote is because women began to assert their right to organize, speak, and act on public and political issues in the 1800s. In the 19th century, people and organizations held conventions to address social issues. Many of these conventions issued a series of resolutions, and this is one of the resolutions of the 1837 Anti-Slavery Convention of American Women. It is the duty of woman and the province of woman to plead the cause of the oppressed in her land and to do all that she can by her voice and her pen and her purse and the influence of her example to overthrow the horrible system of American slavery. In 1859, just two years before the Civil War started, the New England Convention of Colored Citizens was held. They also issued resolutions which were published in The Liberator, the newspaper seen here. The Liberator was a famous anti-abolitionist newspaper that was published weekly. One of the resolutions to come out of this convention called for universal suffrage, that all men and women, black and white, have the right to vote. It would take more than 100 years for universal suffrage to become law throughout the United States. The greatest historian of African-American women's suffrage is Rosalind Turborg Penn. Our exhibition title was inspired by the last sentence of her book that she wrote on this topic. She wrote, African-American women were universal suffragists in the sense that their voices called for the vote for all citizens, not just for themselves. Following the Civil War, the public debated a new amendment to the Constitution to address voting rights. Many suffragists wanted to guarantee voting rights for African American men and for all women. The 15th Amendment was ratified in 1870. It states that the right to vote cannot be denied due to, quote, race, color, or previous condition of servitude. It was interpreted to apply only to men. While African-American women suffragists wanted the vote, many supported the effort to give the vote to black men. The experience of being enslaved made it critical to, to their survival that African-Americans have the vote in some way. For a brief time, 
African American men were able to vote and hold elective office throughout the United States. When Reconstruction ended in the 1880s, Southern white leaders put in place a system of Jim Crow laws that kept African Americans from voting. Suffragists continued to work for the women's vote, but the movement was split over the 15th Amendment. Some white suffragists were angered over not gaining the vote and opposed or were quiet about expanding the vote to African American women. African American women joined women's organizations with white women. The white women in these organizations discriminated against African American members, promoted segregation, and failed to speak out on issues critical to African, African Americans, such as lynching. This led African American women to begin their own organizations that would value their experiences and their perspectives. Several of the most prominent were the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, the National Association of Colored Women, and the Baptist Women's Convention. These organizations had hundreds of thousands of members and were organized at the national, state, and local levels. The communication that took place between these levels allowed women to share ideas and mobilize, such as through petitioning. The Iowa branch of the National Association of Colored Women's Club was later known as the Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. This club was founded in 1902 at a convention in Ottumwa. By 1903, when this photograph was taken, there were eight colored women's clubs in the state of Iowa with more than 100 members. Buxton, Iowa was a company coal mining town named after Ben Buxton, the president of the Cons Consolidation Coal Company. Beginning in the 1890s, Buxton attracted a large African-American population to work in the coal mines. During the late 19th and early 20th century, Many African Americans moved to northern states to find better employment and economic conditions. Buxton was noted for being a multi ethnic community with no legal segregation. The majority of residents were African American. Buxton played an important role in the suffrage movement. The parents of suffrage leader Sue M. Wilson Brown moved to Buxton from Virginia. In June of 1916, a family parade was held in Buxton. This was a get out the vote effort as the women, men, and children who marched in this parade supported women's suffrage. Two days after the parade, a referendum was held to amend the Iowa Constitution to grant women full suffrage. It was defeated by Iowa voters. An investigation by the Women's Christian Temperance Union uncovered fraud, but the election was not invalidated. When coal mining ceased in Buxton, people moved away and the town disappeared. Nationally, the movement to amend the constitution to give women the right to vote continued to gain momentum after 1916. In 1919, the House of Representatives passed the 19th Amendment in May. It passed the US Senate in June. In order for an amendment to become part of the Constitution, it must be ratified or approved by three-fourths of the states. At that time, that meant that 36 states were required to ratify. Iowa moved quickly. A special session of the legislature was called less than a month after the U.S. Senate passed the amendment. Both chambers of the Iowa legislature ratified the amendment on July 2nd. Like Iowa's lawmakers, Iowa's African-American women also moved quickly. The Des Moines League of Colored Women Voters was organized in August of 1919 with Sue M. Wilson Brown as its founder and first president. Leagues were also formed in Keokuk and Fort Dodge. Members of the Des Moines League volunteered in various capacities at the polls for an election in 1920. On October 2nd, 1919, the Iowa Equal Suffrage Association reorganized as the Iowa League of Women Voters in Boone. This organization was later renamed the League of Women Voters of Iowa. In 
that organizations still exist. Sue M. Wilson Brown spoke at the last Iowa Equal Suffrage Association convention, and she and three other members of the Des Moines League of Colored Women Voters were delegates to the first convention of the Iowa League of Women Voters. Nationally, the League of Women Voters was founded by Carrie Chapman Catt, a white suffragist and Iowa native. Next Friday, Dr. Karen Kridowski, who was one of my co-organizers of Toward a Universal Suffrage, will give a History Alive talk about Carrie Chapman Catt. I encourage you to join if you can. Dr. Kridowski is the director of the Carrie Chapman Catt Center for Women in Politics at Iowa State University. On August 18th, 1920, Tennessee became the 36th and final state needed to ratify the 19th Amendment. On August 26th, U.S. Secretary of State Bainbridge Colby certified the ratification. Today, August 26th, is Women's Equality Day. In 1924, Sue Wilson Brown was the chair of the Polk County Republican Committee. She also became the first vice president of the newly formed National League of Republican Colored Women. Here in Iowa, members of this club were unique for using the telephone in the get out the vote drive to elect Calvin Coolidge to a full term as president. Anyone in this state with a phone receives calls or texts prior to an election, and I must have received 100 texts leading up to Tuesday. This is now a practice that is almost 100 years old. Gaining the right to vote is not the end of the story. I mentioned that universal suffrage is about all citizens gaining the right to vote. Universal suffrage should lead to universal representation. All, citizen, all citizens should be represented in positions within our government. The next part of the story is about the ability of African-American women to gain representation in Iowa's government and society. Willie Stevenson Glanton is a member of the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame and a longtime civil rights icon. I spoke about Gertrude Rush earlier and mentioned that she was the first African-American female to practice law in Iowa and the only one to do so until the 1950s. The second was Willie Stevenson Glanton. Educated in Tennessee and in Washington, DC, Mrs. Glanton was admitted to the Iowa bar in 1953. In the 1960s, the US State Department sent her to Africa and Southeast Asia to compare laws and their application to women in these countries. Glanton was the first woman to be an assistant Polk County attorney. She also served as an attorney and equal opportunity advocate with the Small Business Administration. In 1964, Mrs. Glanton became the first African-American woman elected to the Iowa legislature. She was a member of the Iowa House of Representatives. She was also the first African-American selected to the Iowa chapter of the Federal Bar Association. Throughout her life, Mrs. Glanton held leadership positions on numerous boards, commissions, and councils, and was active in church, civic, and community organizations. She was a lifelong advocate for human and civil rights. Originally from Galena, Illinois, La Meta Wynn moved to Clinton, Iowa in 1955 after graduating in nursing from St. Luke's in Cedar Rapids. Besides raising 10 children while working, she found time to be on the Clinton School Board and served as president for three years. After that, in 1993, she ran for mayor. She lost the first attempt and finished third out of five candidates. Coming back two years later in 1995, she won 54% of the vote against four men. She won two additional terms with resounding support. Mrs. Wynn became the first African-American woman to be elected mayor of an Iowa municipality. The Honorable Ramonda Belcher 
currently serves as district associate judge in the state of Iowa. Born in Plymouth, North Carolina, she earned her bachelor's degree with honors from Howard University in 1990 and her Juris Doctorate from Drake University Law School in 1995. On August 20th, 2010, the 90th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, Ms. Belcher was appointed to the bench, becoming the first African-American female judge in Iowa. Prior to her appointment as judge, she was an assistant Polk County attorney for 15 years. This was the same position once held by Willie Stevenson Glanton. The last part of my presentation is going to look at access to the ballot for African Americans today, both here in Iowa and in the country as a whole. I'll also share some of the initial information we're learning about African American participation in this week's historic and important election. The 19th Amendment granted about half a million African American women the right to vote when it was ratified in 1920. Despite its addition to the Constitution, many women of color were not able to vote because of other discriminatory laws. African American women in the segregated South had to wait until the 1960s before they finally won the right to vote. The 24th Amendment in 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 outlawed discriminatory practices like literacy tests, white primaries, and poll taxes that kept African Americans from voting. Iowa was the sole remaining state that required people convicted of a felony to apply individually to the governor's office to have their voting rights restored. That changed on August 5th of this year, when Governor Reynolds signed an executive order to restore the voting rights of people with felonies who have completed their sentences. According to the Des Moines Register, one in 10 African Americans in Iowa has a felony conviction on their record. Governor Reynolds has requested that the Iowa legislature pass an amendment to the state constitution that would automatically restore voting rights for this population. The legislature has so far failed to do so. Whether or not this executive order allowed people with felonies to vote remains to be seen. The Globe Gazette reported before the election that of the 35,000 people with felonies who have completed their sentences in Iowa, only 2,550 had registered to vote in this week's election. An article by the Iowa Capitol Dispatch before the election reported that the governor's order does not require restitution and other fees to be paid before regaining the right to vote. However, a loophole in the order means that some people with felonies may not be released from their sentences before those fees are paid, which may have prevented them from voting in this election. African Americans continue to face obstacles in casting their ballots. One obstacle is access to polling places. In 2013, the Supreme Court issued a decision in the case of Shelby County, Alabama, versus Holder. That decision lifted requirements put in place by the Voting Rights Act in states that have traditionally restricted African Americans from voting. Those states no longer need to seek federal approval before making changes that might harm African Americans' access and ability to vote. A report last year by the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights found that since that decision, States previously subject to the Voting Rights Act have closed 1,688 polling places in locations with large minority populations. Closing polling places means there are fewer places to vote. Fewer polling places means people must tra travel farther to vote and must wait longer to vote. A study in 2016 by UCLA found that voters in African-American neighborhoods waited 29% longer to vote than people in white neighborhoods. The study also found that on average, 
African Americans had to wait longer than half an hour to vote. The coronavirus pandemic closed additional polling places this year, including here in Iowa. The week before the election, Iowa Public Radio and National Public Radio reported that 261 polling places in Iowa would not be open for this year's election. These closures had an impact on 670,000 Iowans, or 30% of the state's registered voters. The most common reason for these closures was the lack of volunteers willing to work at the polls. Most of these closures were in urban areas, which also happened to be where most of the state's Black population lives. Waterloo in Black, Ho in Black Hawk County is home to the state's largest Black population. In that county, 30% of the polling places were closed this year. The reporters of this story discovered that more polling places were closed in areas of Waterloo with larger populations of people of color than in areas with large white populations. Of course, we saw a tremendous amount of voting by mail in this election and early voting. That has led to one of the highest turnouts in our country's history. The Washington Post is projecting that turnout in this election was 66.3% of eligible voters. That would make this election the one with the highest turnout since women won the right to vote. Yesterday on Democracy Now!, reporter Juan Gonzalez shared his research that found that African-American voting increased from 17.1 million in 2016 to 19 million in this election. These Black votes matter. They matter because they can influence the outcome of our elections. Democrats and Republicans know this. In 2016, the Trump campaign targeted the Facebook accounts of Blacks living in black battleground states with negative ads in attempt to try and deter them from voting for Hillary Clinton. Despite this year's increase in African-American voting, it still remains more difficult for them to cast a ballot. Other obstacles that African-Americans face include requiring voters to show an ID to cast a, a ballot. Iowa now has a voter ID law. The most common reason given for this requirement is to prevent fraud in elections, but that is actually rare. African-Americans are less likely to have the required IDs, making it more difficult for them to vote. Recently, the pandemic closed Department of Motor Vehicle locations, where the required IDs can be obtained, which has created an additional hurdle to voting. All states do some type of maintenance on their lists of registered voters. However, African-Americans are more likely to be removed from the voter rolls, even if they are eligible and registered. Research by the Brennan Center for Justice found that after the Supreme Court decision in the Shelby County versus Holder case, that rates of voters being purged from the rolls increased across the country and especially in states that had been under the jurisdiction of the Voting Rights Act. We are, of course, still waiting for the votes to be counted. And uh, right before we uh, started this webinar, I uh, saw an alert on my phone that Georgia uh, is going to be headed towards a recount because the uh, results are uh, so close. So it sounds like it may be uh, even longer yet before we, um, before we hear the results. But it's good that we are counting all of these votes. That, I am sure, is what the African-American suffragists of Iowa would want us to do. 100 years after those women won the right to vote, Senator Kamala Harris of California became the first Black woman and first Asian American woman to become a major party's nominee for vice president. During the primary, when Senator Harris was seeking the Democratic nomination for president, her campaign used the same colors and logo that Shirley Chisholm used 50 years ago. In 1968, Chisholm became the first black woman elected to Congress. 
If the Biden-Harris ticket wins, we will see yet another ex example of universal representation in our government with a black woman in a leadership position of our executive branch for the first time. Most of the information I've shared with you today comes from the Toward a Universal Suffrage exhibition I mentioned earlier. This exhibition was organized by the Iowa Department of Human Rights, the Cary Chapman Cat Center for Women and Politics at Iowa State University, and the Central Iowa Community Museum, a new museum I'm starting. We are grateful to those who have provided funding for the exhibition and the research we needed to do to create it. Toward a Universal Suffrage was funded by the Iowa State University College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Humanities Iowa, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Chrysalis Foundation. Additional support has been provided by the Iowa 19th Amendment Centennial Commemoration Project, which is us using the slogan, hard won, not done, to remind us that the work of suffrage is ongoing. Indeed, we are seeing that the work of suffrage continues this week. I just wanted to show you what the exhibition uh, looks like. And this is uh, what it looked like when it made its stop at the State Historical Museum of Iowa. Um, this was back in June and July. And uh, my, our thanks to uh, the State Historical Society for letting the exhibition stop there. The exhibition continues to tour, and this is where it's touring to next. If it is coming close to you, I hope that you will go to see it. We continue to add additional tour stops, um, and you can check the website of the Central Iowa Community Museum to find more information about where the exhibition is going to be. And here's the contact information for the Community Museum. You can also follow us on social media if you're on social media. I want to thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Eric. I'm excited to open the Q&A portion for the presentation. However, before I pose the first question, I want to remind everyone that you can still submit your questions through the Q&A feature. Uh, but please note, we may not have time to get to all the questions. But here's our first question. Um, in your presentation, you talked about women's groups and publications. Why do you think women's groups and publications were important for suffrage? I think they were very important because uh, one of the things I talked about for these organizations is they were organized at the national, state, and local levels. And these publications were important because they were the primary way that uh, information was shared um, among those different levels. So um, the uh, publication that Sue and Wilson Brown started she would um, you know, receive news from the national organization and include it in the Iowa publication. And she would also submit things that were being done in Iowa to the national organization. And they would include that in the national publication. So those publications were a way of, of sharing information. Our next question is, in what ways were these women also fighting for voting rights for men of color as well? Yeah, um, so the women that I profile uh, in the presentation, um, they lived and worked after the 15th Amendment had been ratified. Um, so African American men in Iowa could vote uh, at the time that they lived, but they could not. Um, so really their fight was, was more for them and um, they were supported, of course, by their hu uh, husbands and, uh, and other African-American men in their community. Um, they certainly did, however, see what was going on in the South. And uh, through their support of uh, the national women's organizations, they were working for uh, the vote for Black men in the South as well as, as Black women. And this is actually about your project itself. So research can be daunting and I'll say sometimes it can be even exhausting. Uh, but how did you go about researching for your project and, and any tips? Sure. So um, an important resource for this was the Library of Congress and they have digitized um, African-American newspapers. And so a lot of the information that we know about the women here in Iowa that I profiled in the presentation, 
um, comes from the newspapers that were published by African Americans uh, here in Iowa. And throughout the presentation, you saw some of those news clips on, on various slides. Those all come from those African American uh, newspapers. There has not been a lot of research um, and a lot of uh, publication of books on this subject, unfortunately. Um, I mentioned Rosalind Turborg Penn. Um, she's the uh, historian who has, uh, is uh, more well-versed than, than anyone on this subject. She published a, a book on, on this subject. There, there's an, um, and a couple other books that have been published. One that I would recommend is called Vanguard. It's by Martha S. Jones, and it was just published back in September. And Martha S. Jones is a professor of history at Johns Hopkins University. And her book looks at, um, at the uh, power and the social movements of African-American uh, women, um, basically from the, the founding of the country right up to today. And a significant portion uh, of her book is of course devoted to the 19th amendment. So for uh, this presentation, for our exhibition, we usually, uh, we, we use those primary sources that I mentioned as uh, well as um, a couple of the books that had already been published on this subject. And for our last question, um, are there any other women you wish you could have included? If so, who and what's their story? There's one other woman that we profile in the exhibition that I didn't include in the presentation. Her name is Maddie Woods. We don't know a whole lot about her. We couldn't find a whole lot of information about her, but we knew two things about her. We knew that she lived in Buxton and we know that in 1916, she marched in that, um, that family parade in Buxton that was the get out the vote effort to support the referendum to give women the right to vote in Iowa. Um, so she's the only uh, other person that we were really able to, to find some information about. There are some other information. Um, there's a woman um, uh, who lived in Davenport. She was very involved in the Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs, um, but we couldn't find a lot of information about her kind of suffrage activities, so we didn't include her in the exhibition. Perfect, and thank you, Eric. And uh, thank you to the educators and students that signed up to be a part of History Live, Vote Through Women. If you have any questions about this or any of our educational programs, uh, please send us an email at museum.education at iowa.gov. Thanks again and have a great day, everyone. Thank you.